This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Desmond Dixon, million dollar sales guy. He's traveling the world and training sales teams. You can find him at remotesalesrecruitment.co. Desmond, how's it going, man? What's up, man? How you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Where are you calling in from? Uh, today I'm in Lisboa, AKA Lisbon. Very good. Awesome. And, uh, surprise, we have a, uh, third, uh, panelist, let's call it. We have Freddie Lansky here with us. So, uh, Freddie, how's it going, man? Good, good. How are you? Thanks for bringing me on to, uh, I guess co-host or be a panelist. Yeah. Co-host. Yeah. Maybe that was the word I was looking for. Uh, this was originally supposed to just be Desmond and I, but I was, talking to Freddie today and I was like, you know what? We haven't done like a a three person kind of podcast just to kind of switch up the format. So I just wanted to play around with the format a little bit. And I thought it'd be cool to just kind of have a a couple of the guys hang out and it'll really be the format for for the listeners. We'll really be kind of learning about Desmond, learning about um, high ticket sales and everything that he's doing with sales because it sounds like he's uh, very successful at that. And then just, um, you know, his philosophies around travel and stuff. So it's really going to be uh, all about Desmond today, but hopefully it doesn't seem like it's, you know, the two of us grilling Desmond, but more of just uh, uh, hanging out. So we'll try to balance out the format. Is everyone, everyone cool with that? Oh yeah. We're going to, we're going to drop some bombs today, man. So let's, <laughs> let's vibe. <laughs> all right. Des- Desmond's on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, Desmond, I mean, uh, so some of the the people on Twitter will will know you because you interact uh, with my Latin life a fair bit. Um, I also noticed that you're you seem to be much more active on uh, LinkedIn, which makes sense because you're very much involved in you know recruiting salespeople and stuff. But give us a sense of like where your uh, social media platforms are, where you're the biggest, and how you present yourself. Uh, by far, LinkedIn and Instagram. And really, Instagram is more like lifestyle stuff, you know, just travel, share some game, talk to my boys, obviously talk to chicks in the DMs there. And then um, LinkedIn is where I I get get business done, right? Like I got a good presence there. I've been growing pretty steady over the last couple of years. And that's where I do a lot of my, you know, marketing to get clients, um, recruit talent and uh, get deals done, man. So and then Twitter is more like my personal just like chill. Like I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm like a shadow on Twitter. Like, cause no one really knows me there that much. And I kind of enjoy just like, you know, using that platform to learn from like really successful people. Um, and you know, people that I vibe with. Right. So it's more just, you know, you know, following like Elon Musk and these guys out there. So, yeah. 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 Definitely makes sense. I, at this point you kind of need Twitter if only to follow Elon. <laughs> exactly. It's like literally like the dude is hilarious, man. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there was some red meat in there in terms of mentioning chicks and we have Freddie, uh, on the call with us. So Freddie, I'm telling you right now, we're not talking about girls this episode at all. (laughs) Don't create any unnecessary editing work for me and my team. We're going to, we're going to keep it business. Um, tough to do when you got three guys who, uh, all travel the world and stuff, but I thought, uh, I thought I kept it pretty PG 13, uh, <laughs> when you did the, the episode, especially considering I was in Colombia at the time. So I had to really bite my tongue quite a bit. Yeah. But, so Fre- Freddie, but yeah, I got, I got a girlfriend now. So yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. So Freddie, for, for anyone listening, um, Freddie was, did I say this already on or offline, but Freddie was previous podcast guest, uh, episode three or four or five, one of the early guests, and uh, knows a lot of the other previous guests as well. Um, so yeah, Freddie's been around for a long time. So yeah, let's get into it. So Desmond, I mean, um, I would love to just hear the the short 
form of your story about kind of how you earned your freedom and and started earning money online and and all of the the hero's journey there. Yeah, well, I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> when I came out of my, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking but uh, <laughs> yo, man, um, so dude, I was an engineer, and dude, I didn't want to do that because you're you know in labs and you know in factories. I was like, f that. Went into corporate, crushed it there in sales. Like I was addicted to just sales. Um, got into personal development. Had this itch to travel the world. Left corporate. Had no plans, my man. Like, I just moved to California uh, from Denver at the time. And my buddy had a place open by the beach. He was in a high ticket space. I was like, F it. Here's $1,000. I'm moving in. Went to Costa Rica for a month. Came back. Cried on a plane on the way back because I was like, wow, this is the first time I ever felt free in my life. I get to do whatever I want. Um, and started the business. I scaled it to three cities in a holistic space. Um, it's failed overnight over the pandemic because there was no more events, right? Like no person to person things. So then I got into consulting and high ticket sales from there. Um, just naturally, just people introduced me to people, built a couple teams, seven figures, then just word of mouth, people reaching out to me saying, hey, how did you do that? Um, started consulting more and more, found out people charge money for recruiting. So I'm like, whoa, there's a whole business around recruiting. So I, um, yeah, man, so I started to recruit and consult and now I've got a team of about six people with me now and we work with around 35 companies so far year to date. I um, don't know when this is going to release, but yeah, so now we got about 35 companies. We have over 700 sales guys and right now we're rapidly scaling. Um, I think this month is going to be a record month. I think, dude, this week we, we have more job openings um, this week than we did last month. So that just kind of gives you an idea of like of the scale that we're we're growing pretty quickly. It's pretty it's nuts, man. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, actually starting to sell again on the side, just to stay like tapped in because a lot of recruiters out there like don't actually sell anymore. And um, so I'm putting on my my hard hat and uh, I'm actually starting to sell again. I mean, I get three thousand dollars for each close, but you know, <laughs> the money's great, but it's really for to lead by example, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm placing guys and I want to, I want to attract guys who are doing 20, 40 K a month because my pipeline is with some of the best people in the world. And I know I need to, you know, attract those guys who want to come sell for my offers. Right. So yeah, man, um, it's been a great, a great ride. Um, what trade it for anything in the world. And, um, I got some very controversial philosophies around high ticket sales and dude, I just had like a freaking monologue earlier today with my head of sales. Like, bro, like I'm, all these dudes out here, like just spewing, you know, bull crap, um, I think it's not setting up a lot of these guys to be, you know, they're optimal. So, yeah, man, that's how I got in the game. I'm actually getting back in it, like I told you. And um, yeah, man, that's that's, <laughs> that's the journey, bro. That's awesome. I love it. By the way, Desmond, do me a favor and just put your mic um, maybe slightly further uh, from from your mouth, just so it's like not hitting the like the, I don't know, like super high on the range. Um all good though. So I, I thought something that would be cool because um, a lot of people aren't even familiar with what is high ticket closing. Some people aren't familiar with what high ticket is. Uh, some people aren't familiar with what maybe like sales recruitment or I don't know if you call it headhunting is. So do you want to just give us like a, a lay of the land in, in terms of these things? Yeah, for sure, man. So High ticket sales is essentially you're remote working from anywhere as long as you're working the certain uh, the certain hours. You have a unique and high skill, right? Like you have to be really good at an empathy, really good at connecting with people, really good at following frameworks, really disciplined. I think having your aesthetics on point, so your background, how you dress, how you talk, right? The way you communicate. And then most importantly, you got to be really good at asking for the order, right? And then uh, finding mm -hmm. objections. And just really just being consistent, man. So it's you're selling like these consulting packages or agency packages or coaching, like it's some type of professional service, some type of technology or a mixture of both. Some of them are like uh, high level masterminds. Those are usually the most expensive. So like 30K, 50K, 100K, you know, to get into some of these like really high level masterminds. Right. So, yeah, man, you're just coming in and collecting bags, bro, on the Internet. That's That's pretty much it for an entrepreneur. Okay, cool. And so what is high ticket sales compared to just like normal sales? 
bro, it's night and day, man. I wish I knew this so much sooner. I did corporate sales. I did great, man. I did, you know, millions of dollars in corporate, but it's so much more baby. It's just a different thing, right? Like you're doing negotiations and contracts and like all types of crazy stuff. And high ticket sales, you're getting, you're more 1099 and you literally, you eat what you kill. So you don't get a base. You just get calls in your calendar. It's very demanding. Um, so if you're not closing, you get fired or you just quit because you see the writing on the wall. Um, it's definitely a faster close, right? So one call closes is sometimes two. I think three gets too complicated because, you know, the farther away the deal is from the first touch of the closing process, the less likely it closes. But it's a way faster cycle, man. Like I can remember a my first 35K deal in corporate took me three months, four months to close to get paid on. In high ticket sales, I can I literally close one Friday right? And I get paid the next week, right? So it's way faster and um, you get more bank, you get more commission obviously than in corporate. Okay. Definitely makes sense. And um, so what, what types of things you kind of alluded to it, but what types of things make sense in the high ticket sphere? Like does it, it would a, a SaaS product not make sense? Cause that's more B2B sounds like high ticket is a little bit more B2C where it's just like you and the the client, you know, bust out your credit card or is it B, you know, what's the breakdown B2B, B2C? Yeah, man. I think so for SaaS, man, SaaS gets to sell itself. It's a product led, led sale, right? Does it matter like, you know, how good the salesperson is? If the product sucks, they're going to churn, right? Or ask for a refund or something like that. So mm -hmm. SaaS skill set is a lot different than enrolling someone to take a chance on a service, right? So that service can be a consumer uh, to a consumer, like coaching, personal development coaching or fitness coaching or I don't know, men's coaching, whatever. Right. Or it can be even like marketing services like, hey, I want you to sign this 5K a month retainer. Plus, I want to get performance piece of your revenue. Right. And I'm going to own your IP over six months. You got to have a high skill set for them to choose you over the guy down the street or the other sales guy that they're talking to. Right. So it's just kind of a different framework where it's more trust in a consultative led sale than it is in the SaaS space or the technology space where, you know, it's really a product led approach. If you're doing a demo, like it's night and day, man. Like it's night and day to me in terms of like the level of skill you need. Okay. So typically no demo. <laughs> no demos, bro. <laughs> no, no demo. Okay. No PowerPoint. Okay, cool. And, um, what like what are some of the biggest things like so fitness packages i guess like social media management um like what are what are some of the most popular high ticket things that people are are selling um the amazon automation space is pretty big or airbnb automation so anything where there's some arbitrage in terms of investment that's a really good space um because those can pay i mean do you can if you get one of those offers you can make between 15 and 50k a month but you got to be good, right? You can't be a sucker. Um, I see digital marketing is pretty saturated. I mean, I did digital marketing. I made some good money there when I first got into the industry. But it's super saturated. It's very commoditized and it's hard to stand out. Um, the dream offers, the real money, my dude, is in the masterminds. When you're, but it's a whole different conversation. Like you're talking to a guy on the other end of the line that's you know got you know maybe two million in the bank and he just wants to be around other guys that at his level, right? And he's paying for pretty much like a membership into a country club. So like you're representing that brand, right? So I think the masterminds are dope. Um, automation is dope. And then marketing. Yeah, those are my top three. Fitness and all that stuff. You can make good money, but I'm just not a fan of it because it's usually low ticket, bro. Like 2K, 5K. Okay, makes sense. Um, yeah, so you, so you don't touch like the 2K, 3K, 5K stuff. You're trying to do your high definition of high ticket is like five figures. Bro, I'm an all I'm an equal opportunity paper receiver, bro. Like, right? I mean, yes, I don't want dumb offers, but I'm I'm not gonna turn someone's business down. Like, for instance, this guy recently, he's looking for a closer. His offer is only like four five k, but he's paying for ads, five or six calls a day. Sure, there's someone who who can start off in that offer who's not yet ready for a twenty five k offer, right? So I take B level offers, which I consider that, just so I can, you know, to keep you know, keep deal flow. But then yes, I'm personally out doing BD development, you know, business development and networking for those 25K, 35K, 50K offers. 
for those seasoned vets, right? Who are only doing 10K a month, right? So I do all of it, bro, because I like money and I'm a capitalist. <laughs> and so, but um, yeah, man, I, I don't turn I don't turn down business unless the entrepreneur and the business model sucks, right? Mm-hmm. And then I, if I wouldn't sell it on myself, sell it from sell it myself at one point. Yeah, makes sense. And by the way, for any listeners, we will eventually start talking about travel and some other stuff. But I think it is pretty cool to uh, peel back the curtain on on some of this high ticket sales stuff. It's definitely one of the main ways that non-technical people can um, earn a living and uh, be a digital nomad. Um, obviously, you could be a digital nomad, you know, being a software developer or, or doing something technical. Um, but I think as a non-technical person that also doesn't want like a nine to five remote job and wants to do a eat what you kill type thing or something a little more entrepreneurial, um, uh, high ticket closing and just remote sales in general is a, is a pretty good option. Would you agree with that, Desmond? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think this is something important to say is yes, you can get those like easy offers as flexible, but you're not going to make crazy money a month. Like you can do four to seven K a month, but if you want to make crazy money, you're going to, you're just, you're going to have to be like committed <laughs> to the game to be blunt. What does that mean? Committed to the game? Um, you got to be a, and yes, type of mentality. Like, okay, I did this. What else can I do? Like, how can I up level myself? Like you, you gotta be in an alpha like mindset, right? Like you, it's, it's, <laughs> like you can't just be like waking up like oh I want to be flexible today like no you got to be waking up like who has my money what can I do to be a better person how can I serve like how can I you know uh, help this person like you just got to be super hungry and not be attached to how many hours you work because that's the only way you get better it's like being Kobe right like Kobe goes to the gym like before practice after practice after the game like you just gotta get your reps in and speed up your timeline right. But people want different things, right? If you want to be chill, hang out on the beach, have a certain skill set, make 5K a month, 6K a month, you could do that easily. But if you want to make, you know, 30K a month, 40K a month, you just got to be at a different level within yourself um, and show up at a different level to have conversations with certain people. You know what I mean? Yeah, makes sense. And uh, Freddie, we'll bring you in in a second. I just had uh, one burning question and then maybe Freddie, you can you can jump in. But my burning question was, so when you have these... Um, you know, high ticket closer mercenaries for hire, how much are they involved in, I guess, the whole sales funnel? Or are they literally just getting calls on their calendar and they're taking them? And I guess obviously they have some context so they can actually sell, but are they, they're probably not involved in lead generation or are they involved in like nurturing leads and the follow up and and things like that? Like what's the, you know what I mean? The dynamic between the salesman and the, I guess the whole marketing funnel or, or the, the real business. Yeah. Usually there's some type of customer acquisition strategy. So Facebook ads, sometimes a cold email campaign, something, and then you have a setter or a sales development representative. And those guys um, are responsible for putting calls on the calendar, sometimes qualifying those leads. Mm-hmm. And then the closer is the person that comes in like Kobe at the end of the game and shoots the game when it shots. Right. Like, you know, those guys are, you know, snipers, right? They're putting they're putting them down. Um, now, in terms of the follow-up, yes, like, they're responsible for the follow-up. You'll hear a lot of different guys, you know, different philosophies on follow-up. Me, personally, follow-up is where you get paid for those leads that didn't go because people have different timelines based upon their situation, depending on the offer you're in. Um, but, yeah, as a salesperson, as soon as they're handed to you, it's your responsibility to put them in the bag. And then you have the entrepreneur of the business also doing nurturing marketing, right? They might be doing webinars, email campaigns, events, promotions, right? Just kind of depends on what their, you know, marketing strategy is on the back end to nurture those leads. We're drop, we're dropping game, bro. We're dropping some game here, man. <laughs> I have actually, uh, and I'm a semi-anonymous guy, but I have actually worked in a, like a, like in a side hustle capacity for a high ticket closing company in the past. So I'm a little bit aware of, of uh, the dynamics of some of this stuff where um, just to, like for a little bit of context. And I, I remember there was a lot of sort of give and take between the setter and the closer where it's like, it's like, oh, you're feeding me bad leads. You didn't qualify that lead enough. How did this guy get through? This guy's from friggin' India or like whatever it is. Right. 
And um, it's kind of like an interesting dynamic um, where often I feel like the setter in some ways is doing more of the work and the, the closer is like once that once they, the person like gets to a closer call, they're often like, you know, like 80% sold already. Or like, what, what's your kind of philosophy on the dynamic between, you know, the funnel and the setter and the closer, Desmond? Yeah, man, the setters have the hardest jobs in every organization because they're on the front lines, like getting like bullet shot at them, right? Like they're just sitting there taking it. Closers are back in a bag drinking tea, waiting for the cake to come out, right? If they're good. But my philosophy is this, and this is what's what's going to get me in trouble. I can't stand entitled sales guys. So like guys who are like super arrogant, like who think that the world bends to their will, like I like guys who are hungry, who are willing to support, who have an abundant mindset. Because as the closer, it's your job to develop that person giving you money, right? If you're financially incentivized to help that person become successful because they are feeding you the leads, right? They want you should they should be throwing you like, you know, alley oops. And so I think that the dynamic, so if the closer was a setter and understands the grind. Um, they should be able to give that person guidelines and like ramp up pretty quickly. If they are mm-hmm. bad closer, then like they're going to complain, they're going to talk stuff, and then that means that's leadership as the entrepreneur or sales manager. You need to come in and and shake it up. Like you got to lead, like leadership, right? So um, it's pretty common. But when closers start complaining about leads, they suck. Like that's my opinion. Like that's some loser stuff in my personal opinion. Like don't complain about leads, bro. Like it's every, like, this makes sense triggers me man do you think that every just, closer has to start as a setter yeah man absolutely you're not walking in and like you know shooting you know shooting game winning shots man you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta play the game man so i think that uh, any great closer can should be if you okay if you want to sell ten thousand dollar twenty thousand dollar packages can you sell a phone call a free phone call if you can't sell a free <laughs> phone call then you're not going to be able to sell a ten thousand dollar twenty thousand you don't have the language capacity the communication capacity the like the emotional intelligence to sell a ten or twenty thousand dollar package like it just won't work. <laughs> it's, it's, it won't work, bro. Makes sense. Uh, I have a couple more questions, um, and sorry if this is too grilling of a of a of a podcast, but I think I think people are definitely getting value out of this. So I I remember that like if something's in the you know twenty five hundred three k even up to five k range or something less than 10K, you can put that all on your credit card in one go, right? And you can close on the closing call. But when you're getting into 10K, 25K, 15K, 40K, whatever it is, that's not a credit card payment anymore, I feel. That's like a wire transfer. So are people like putting a deposit down or how do, how do you actually do the, the, the closing there? Uh, you could definitely do a deposit. I'm a bigger fan of just going for the ACH um, or the wire. You just you just treat it like it's normal business. Like, okay, authorize the agreement. Amazing. We got the contract signed. Okay, awesome. Like, can you log into your bank and wait, literally sit there and wait for them to wire you the money and then send you yeah. a screenshot of the proof of funds, right? Or email, right? So you just, okay. it's just, it's, it's easy. It's, if they got the money in their bank account, it's just a couple clicks. Boom. Money sent. Let's start the process, right? Okay, so you're going full wire. It's not even a credit card thing anymore. Um, cool, that makes sense. And then um, more, a more broad question. So, is this the type of thing where someone could do it as like a side job, where maybe they have a main job that gives them their sort of like uh, living expenses cushion, their their you know their five k a month, whatever it is, and then on the side they do this, they pick up you know, a couple closing calls a day and, uh, you know, try to, you know, hopefully like double their, their, their income or something like that and sort of do it on the side. Or do you think that in like for what you're recruiting for, are you expecting people to go all in? Burn the bridges, bro. Burn the boats, storm the island. Like, you know, if you want to work part time, I just tell people to go Uber, bro. Go Uber, go grab, go work, (laughs) go work at Starbucks. Like, you know, it's like, I, it, just because it's so intense sales and it's really hard to get dialed in and get a cadence if you're not like mentally all in, right? Because mm. you got to remember you're a stranger on the internet asking other strangers to send you a large sum of money to trust you. 
right? So you, you got to have your frequency on point. So if you just got out of a meeting with your boss to talk about like website back end stuff, like you're not your mental, you're not going to be there mentally to help this person change their life. Maybe at a, at a, it's like a different mental framework, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really, really hard to do it on the side um, personally. And I will, any of my clients won't hire you because they want guys who are all in as well because they want to use the productivity to the max of their ability, right? So yeah, man, it won't work, bro, to be blunt. <laughs> okay. So it's full time, yeah. but it's commission only. Commission only. Some of them give a give a base, right? After you prove yourself, but they're not gonna just give you a base without you like proving yourself, right? Because they're already burning money on you getting calls on your calendar with ads, right? Um, and as a sales guy, you don't want a base. <laughs> like I don't want a base, I want more commission. Give me a couple more points if you're if you know what you can do. So when the sales guys start talking about bases to me, like I immediately like ignore them and just say, go to the next guy. Cause like, I don't want, you know, I want guys who want to make as much money as possible with their effort, not oh, a couple thousand dollars a month. Right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But I imagine that even still you go full time. I imagine only half your day is even filled with calls, like even getting four calls a day, like four closing calls would, would kind of be a lot, right? Uh, I would say you can get as little as two all the way up to 10, just depending really? on the offer and the marketing. And even if you did only get three to four calls a day, once again, you got to have this and, and what else attitude, are there old leads I can call? What else can I do? Like you got to be like show up and like want to win. Like what else can I learn? Right. Like it's super important. Right. Um, to have that like in what right, else. So you're can like I learning do? about the product and stuff in your free time. Yeah. The product learn, uh, reaching out to other, I don't care if you're a close, like reaching out to old leads, like just get in the bag, bro. Like having that mentality of hunger, like someone has my money out there. Someone's looking for what we have. Someone's waiting for me to talk to them. And not just like twiddling your thumbs, hanging around like, doo, 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 doo. you know, like you got to have that killer mindset if you want to be successful at it, to be blunt. I'm just speaking game, bro. I play some, a bunch of guys, bro. No, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. I know I like it. And so um, my thought, so do you want to speak about just the the economics of it? Like if, if the ticket is this much, like what percentage does the closer get? Yeah, man. So the typical range appointment centers get, can get five to ten percent um, of clo- cash collected. Closers I've seen between seven and even all the way up to twenty percent, really depending on the ticket and the sales process. Um, all of it's on cash collected, and then there's PIFs, right? So like, you know, if you do if you do a pay in full, you get you know this bonus. If you get you know, X amount of deals this month, you get this bonus. Or if, as, as a team, if we collect X amount of cash this week, everyone gets this bonus, right? So there's usually a base commission plus like performance bonuses based upon what activity that the entrepreneur wants to incentivize on the right. team in order to hit the overall KPIs. Okay. Is there like an industry standard, whether it's like 10, 15% for the closer or something like that? Uh, really, it always hovers around 10, right? I think 10 is like the safest number. I've seen it below uh, below 10, right? And I've seen it above 10. Uh, when you get to 20%, it kind of gets questionable. Like, why are you giving me 20%? Because the numbers don't add up in the business model, right? 30, 30% is usually the max a uh, entrepreneur should be willing to pay for like revenue, right? Including marketing, because anything above that is really hard to reinvest in the business and uh, be profitable, right? So anything about 20, anything close to 20%, I'll start questioning why, right? Unless you're a strategic partner and you want to, you know, hack someone else's, you know, that's high level entrepreneur talk now we're getting into. But um, yeah, man, I don't see anything at 20% because the numbers don't really match up. Makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of money anyway. Like if you're talking 10K and you're getting 10%, that's a thousand bucks for a, a one hour phone call or maybe two one hour phone calls. Oh, yeah, bro. You can make good money. Like, amazing money. Speak to that a bit. Speak to that a bit. Yeah, man. So let's do the numbers, bro. So if you get a close a day, you take six calls. That means your average is heck because you may have six calls. One doesn't show up. Five show up. You close one. That's 20% close rate, right? That's like super average. 
let's say the tickets uh five thousand dollar you know you collect five thousand dollars in cash uh on average it's a 10 percent commission that's 500 500 times five is 2500 2500 times four that's 10k that's how you get 10k a month um which is pretty easy man if you're above average right if you're you know, uh, let's say a top one percent, or you're probably closing two or three a day. And then obviously, you do the math. You're doing twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month, right? And then um, obviously, these numbers get even more crazy, right? So if you're doing like, let's say, Amazon automation, done for you offers, or Airbnb automation, where these offers are like twenty k, you know, ten percent com, you're getting two k per close for let's say, you know, an hour or two of your time. You close maybe three a week, two a week. Um, you know, the numbers, the numbers can, the numbers can get pretty crazy, man. The, and what's crazy about sales is that they come in waves because your energy levels and your like certainty levels are so high that you're projecting, like you're just, you're willing to say things that are more ballsy, right? It's like the more timid you are, the less likely you'll close. Like you got to be very, yeah, you get that flow state. Yeah. That flow state. You just start reeling them in. Like this one chick, she got her first three closes over the weekend. She did $110,000 cash collected. And made you know ten grand in one day. Her first three closes came all in one day. It was like wow, like it was like she was in God mode. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone salivating in the audience, listeners out there? Are are they are the listeners thinking? Damn, yeah, I, I want to go work for so. for Desmond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the dark side, man. Come to the dark side, Freddie. Yeah, what's up? Any any thoughts on what you're hearing so far? Yeah, yeah, this this sounds uh, very interesting. I, I, I like, I won a few talks about people doing sales and sales recruiting, but it sounds like you know a lot more about this world than than I do. Um, you know, I guess I mean to throw the old cliche that you know life is sales, but yeah, it's super interesting to think about it. You know, I'm I'm grinding like crazy doing. You know, I do consulting as well, like award bookings uh, with points and miles and things like that for, you know, a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks there. The total may come out to, you know, a few grand on a really good month. And, you know, this girl's making that in just one sale. And I'm thinking, man, I I gotta, I gotta, I gotta switch business models here, you know? (laughs) Bro, you're literally playing in people's heads. Like you become a Jedi. Because you're just your your awareness of how people use their language, their tone, even their body language, because they're on camera as well. Like you just you just pick up your it's it's crazy. You're just watching like it's like Picasso, you're like painting this picture of this experience in this person's head and you're helping them change their life, right? Because they're on the phone because they have a problem or a desire, right? They're not on the phone because, you know, they don't want to be on the phone, they're on the phone because they have a problem that wants to be solved, right? Um, so it's fun, man. But dude, let's talk about some travel, bro. Because I, 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 I think that I think the I think the people I think the people are ready to hear some hear some travel game. How, what you, what you think, Vance? I think that sounds good. I had one just random technical question: Is it a Zoom call? Is it typically a video call, or is it phone? Or what what is the actual uh, software and stuff that you're using at least right now in 2023? 80% of it's going to be on Zoom. I personally ditch Zoom and use Google Meets now because I'm a boss and I can do what I want. And I fucking, or excuse my language, I can't stand Zoom. Um, I've seen, you can use phone calls as well. Like, I think that actually phone calls can be better personally, depending on the offer and, and the persona. Um, but yeah, usually you're using Zoom and, you know, drop the link in the chat. Let me know when you finish working on that while I work on your onboarding, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I have one more just like funny question because when I did the the high ticket sales thing, one thing that would happen is it it was on video, it was uh, I believe Zoom, but some people would take the call on their phone and some people would take it in their car. Like randomly like 10, 20% of people because it's all American clients, they would just take the call in their car and we would just laugh about it offline that like Americans are just so like car centric. It's insane. But would you ever do something where like if they're on their phone or they're on in the car, then then you reschedule? Because we would kind of do stuff like that. We'd be like, look, you can't have the phone, you can't have the phone in your hand. You have to like place it on a mount or or something, and I will wait for you. I don't know, stuff like that, just to like set frame, basically. I was just curious if you had any anything about Bro, that. As soon as I see someone in the car, I'm like, okay, I have a rule where I don't do Zoom calls with people in the cars. It's for your safety and, um, you know, just straight up. I don't. 
It's just so distracting. Even if it's parked, me. even if it's parked, they're like, I just I got really out care. of the gym and in the parking lot. Yeah, I was wondering I if that really could be that. like a strategy where you're like pretending to be in the car to just show how busy you are. Like, look, no, I, but you, I, they I, see it because you're on video and you can see the guy with the headrest behind his head, and you're like, you're like, yo, I don't want to do this with this guy in the car because you're like, I think this is not, a perfect not, segue for not living in America. Like, they're in their car and sitting in traffic so much, they just eventually just start working. You know, but might as well, right? I mean, you're just sitting in traffic all day. Too, they're in like the McDonald's parking lot or something. But sorry, Desmond. So how do you handle that, <laughs> bro? I don't take, I don't call, talk to people while they're in the car, man. It's just, just like my my role. Like, hey, call me when you get home. Like, oh, will you be home in ten minutes? Okay, let's jump on Zoom then. See you in ten minutes. Send you an updated invite. All right, just reschedule them on the call. Like, that's my personal role. Okay, cool. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah. that. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries, including the USA, Canada, all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MYLATINLIFE at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Bada bing, bada boom. Recording now. Cool. So that was a solid half hour of, of breaking down the world of high ticket sales. And I thought uh, at Desmond's behest, we'll switch over into talking a little bit about travel uh was there anything desmond that was kind of on the top of your mind uh in terms of travel or how's uh how's lisboa going yeah man i um dude i i, I follow you on twitter and i only i've only spent i think four months in latin america and um i'm itching to go back man and i'm like regret <laughs> spending so much time in europe but um yeah man i i tend to travel like two to three months at a time and uh, travel on the weekends, and I'm pretty much really in love with Asia, but I want to give Latin America another shot. So I'm, I'm planning a, uh, a trip down there for for Carnival for a couple months, and hopefully I, I might stick, bro. Nice. And which, nice. which I, Carnival? I might, would I might be? be a Carnival. There's so many carnivals. <laughs> I know, man. Um, are you guys going to go this year or what? Yeah, I, I got a wedding in Buenos Aires. Um, that's my mom's from there, so I'm I'm there from time to time. Literally the week after Carnival, so I'm like, damn, I, I got to get back down to Brazil. I've done the Carnival, and I haven't done the Rio one. I've done Recife, and I've done the Carnival in Floripa. So I definitely like to check out the the Rio Carnival at some point. Yeah, man, I got I got some people in Brazil, so. You know, um, I I definitely need to make a special appearance, and I've already spent some time in Colombia. So um, yeah, hopefully I fall in love with Brazil, man. Because I'm looking for a second base outside of uh, Southeast Asia. It's it's very different than the rest of Latin America. I remember when I recorded with with Vance, we got into a long discussion about how Brazil's like the the country that everyone kind of forgets about, and it's definitely hard mode. You know, when people first go abroad if they're in europe maybe they move to lisbon if they're from the u.s or canada maybe they move to mexico city or playa del carmen brazil is it's a country with a lot of culture and obviously the women and everything but it's not it's not made for tourists at all it's not made for digital nomads at all it's definitely everyone says it's it's kind of advanced mode so i think well, you seem pretty experienced traveling, but you'll see once you get there, there's a bit of a learning curve. Like even the simplest things like getting money out of the ATM or getting a SIM card can suddenly become a full day or even multi-day tasks. And things can get a bit frustrating living in, in, in Brazil. And now everyone's using this thing called PIX, which is basically like their PayPal. But the problem is you can't, uh, I don't think you can get a PIX account unless you have a CPF, which is like their ID number. And you need the CPF to do a lot of different things, like even for in certain cases to buy domestic airline tickets. So it's <laughs> it's not Mexico. Uh, it's it's a it's a difficult place, but um, it's just so much fun. It's a great place to visit. I've always I've always been trapped between Mexico and Brazil, and then everyone's saying like Mexico is kind of my wife, and Brazil is like my mistress or my side chick because I go there for a while and I fall in love. But then after like 
two or three months, you know, just the frustration of certain things about living there just get to me and I end up coming back to Mexico. So you'll, you'll see for yourself. Um, but it's nice and it's, it's a good break from all these countries, uh, like Portugal, Lisbon and Mexico that have become so popular with digital nomads these days. You know, when I started traveling, I would go, you know, weeks or even months without seeing, you know, foreigners. And now they're, outnumber locals in a lot of these neighborhoods uh, by a significant margin. But once you get to Brazil, especially outside of Rio, Sao Paulo, Floripa, you'll see there's, there's, there's compared to Mexico, Colombia, um, you know, Portugal, there's very few foreigners uh, living and working there like expats and digital nomads and that kind of thing. Man, I think at this point, I'm almost ready to go anywhere because I'm so bored of Europe, bro. I've been here for like three months and I'm like, I got like I almost bought like it was almost three or four times where I almost caved and just like bought a ticket back. If I didn't have to speak at this event in in um, a couple of weeks, I, I would have left <laughs> like a month ago, like easily left a month ago, um, which is like one of my favorite parts about being, I guess, a digital nomad or living outside the U.S. is. You could just like change your mind and just go anywhere you want at any time. Like that's my by far my favorite part about traveling. Um, just kind of go. Yeah. Do what you want, bro. Um, but yeah, you said something interesting about Brazil. I kind of did some homework on that kind of stuff. Like the I, I thinking about I thought about getting the digital nomad uh, visa for Brazil. But I just know myself and I get bored after two to three months. I think almost everywhere or at least want to change up a scene a little bit. Um but uh, I'm hoping, man, that, you know, Brazil, there's enough diversity between Sao Paulo for, for Leap and, um, you know, maybe up there in the, in the, in the uh, I guess, Baja or so, uh, El Salvador. Is that is that right? Salvador? Like, uh, Salvador. There's no, there's yeah, no Salvador. El, El Salvador is the country. Salvador is the city. <laughs> but yeah, Brazil is kind of divided into, well, there's various different regions, but, you know, painting a... 50,000 foot view. There's North Brazil and South Brazil. And South Brazil has a much higher standard of living, much higher salaries, um, a lot of infrastructure, um, you know, better restaurants, more people speak English. And those are like Brazil's three southern states, Rio and Sao Paulo. The rest of the country is just like this, this wild west, crazy, nonstop party. There's also no economy really, other than a little bit of agriculture, which is probably why they have a nonstop party and it's in my opinion it's almost like two completely different countries so i I think the south of brazil is a good place to start but the north of brazil is really where you get a lot of adventure and all these crazy places that nobody ever visits and the locals are excited to see you and it has this kind of like carnival every month of the year type of atmosphere and it's definitely not to be missed as well. But um, <laughs> as bad as the infrastructure is in the south and the north, it's like non non existent, right? So if you're trying to do sales calls and you know somewhere in the Amazon uh, rainforest or in some of these beach towns, just forget it. Um, the internet Starlink. in the north of Brazil, yeah, yeah, you gotta bring bring a satellite dish with you. Get a <laughs> you're gonna need it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good place. I think Sao Paulo and Rio uh, and Floripa in the south are good places to start because they have higher. So the English levels in Brazil are really, really low, especially outside of Sao Paulo. And even in Rio, like you would think in Copacabana and Ipanema with so many foreigners coming in, they would at least speak a little bit of English. But barely the waiters know barely enough English to take your order. So it's not like Lisbon where, you know, the vast majority of people under the age of 40, especially speak English, like you're going to have to learn Portuguese and you're going to have to learn it fast. Uh, especially if you're thinking about, you know, living outside of uh, Zona Sul in Rio and Zona Sul is like where Ipanema, Leblon, Copacabana are, but even there you really need it. So it's definitely a learning curve, but, you know, like you were saying about sales, you know, for uh spoils go to the victor right so if if you can get over that hump and and figure all the stuff out brazil is a really cool place and in my opinion it's it's my favorite country um you know the only reason i don't live there is it's just it's too many too many frustrations i think in in the quality of life but to visit for a few months i don't i don't think you'll get bored and it's such a big country that if you get bored with one city like Floripa, Sao Paulo, and Salvador are like three completely different cities with completely different vibes. Like you might as well be in three different countries. So 
you know, once you're in there, I, I would take some time to explore the different regions and the different cities and, and towns and, and figure out, you know, which, which one's called you. I, I used to work as a tour guide running tours from Rio up to Salvador, um, covering a tiny state called Espirito Santo, which is it's not really that much that interesting there. But Bahia, I think, is one of the most underrated travel destinations in the world, starting at the south in Porto Seguro and then working your way up from Ariel de Ajuda and, and Caraiva up to Itacaré Bahia, which is kind of a surf town. People have compared it a little bit to Mancora in Peru or Sayulita in Mexico. Um, and then there's this island just south of Salvador called Mojo de Sao Paulo, not to be confused with Sao Paulo, the city. Um, it's actually two islands, Mojo de Sao Paulo and Boipeba is the one south of there. And it's, it's just like a tropical place. It kind of reminds me a bit of the Brazilian version of the, the beach, you know, with Leonardo DiCaprio, that movie. It's like this kind of like magical place that like you feel like you discover it when you visit. And then finishing up the tour from Salvador, like that's a really cool backpacking travel itinerary to do the first time you're in Brazil. Like just start in Rio and, and work your way up to Salvador. There's like a lot of cool stuff to see along the way. Man, dude, I, I like I cannot jump places so fast like i just need a base for the three months and then travel on the weekends um doesn't you know for like a four-day trip or sometimes a whole week but um i can't like i feel like i won't get enough time there unless i'm like there for two to three months or if i'm visiting there like multiple times and, and you know kind of get a lay of land that way um and I prefer to probably stay in the city. So I heard a lot of mixed things about Sao Paulo. Like I heard some things like, oh, it's like one of my buddies that live down there. You know, he's like, you know, from San Francisco. He's like, bro, like you'll love it here. And I've talked to other people and they're like, bro, like don't like go to live in Fleur Leap or, you know, maybe Rio. Um, but uh, but I also heard a lot of great things about Buenos Aires. But I think um, the weather um uh it's probably not the most optimal year round right like or or am i or am i wrong there freddie um it's, it's it's not that bad uh like the average high from june uh september is like in the mid 50s the mid 60s uh and lows around the 40s so for non-american listeners that would be highs around like 15 and lows around five but it's not really that bad and it's and it's really sunny too so that makes the winters a little bit tolerable but uh it's definitely the predominant um buenos aires is cool to cold not frigid but cool to cold most of the year and then they have a summer from late november early december until early april um and that's the best time to visit so the vast majority of my friends who are in mexico city have moved down to Buenos Aires, ended up moving down there because the prices in Mexico City have gone up to almost like a mid-tier U.S. city level prices. And Buenos Aires is as cheap as it's, it's, it's probably not only the cheapest place in Latin America, Buenos Aires has to be one of the cheapest places in the world right now due to the inflation crisis they're going through right now, especially if you bring uh, money down with you or you can Western Union money yourself. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. Like here, I just wanted the OXO. It's like the equivalent of a 7-Eleven in the U.S. to buy just a couple of beers, uh, microwave popcorn, some ice cream, to just hang out here at home with my girlfriend. And it was like $35. It was like crazy, getting crazy expensive here in Condesa. And in Buenos Aires, I mean, I, I went to the market there. I just bought all this all this random stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I converted it out. It's like I had like two plastic bags full of groceries and it was like two and a half dollars. And this was what, like maybe four or five months ago. Um, so that's what's been attracting a lot of digital nomads and entrepreneurs down there. Now, that being said, the two issues with Buenos Aires are, one, the weather, and two, the, the, the people there, I, I hear this a lot from you know people living down there, and I lived down there for a year as well, that when you go to Brazil, Mexico, to a lesser extent, Colombia, um, even in Thailand, you, you feel like the people are warm and welcoming, and the Argentinians, they're, they're a bit more European, like the Spaniards or the Italian, they're, they're a bit more closed off. And it's kind of hard to make certain friends in, in Argentina. And I think for that reason, 
Argentinians and specific uh, Porteños, which are people from Buenos Aires, have a really bad reputation in uh, Brazil and Mexico and a lot of times with the, the digital nomads and entrepreneurs that live in Buenos Aires as well, right? So Brazil and Argentina are neighboring countries, but you know, once you get over their love of meat and soccer, uh, they culturally wise, they're, they're quite different countries, right? So Brazilians have a tendency to see Argentinians as close and uptight and arrogant and think that that their country is superior because, you know, back a very long time ago, they were by far the richest country in Latin America. Now they're more or less the same as all the other ones, economically speaking, um, if not a, a little bit less now because of this economic crisis. And Argentinians have a tendency to see Brazilians as, as fake and, and non-authentic because they're so, so warm and open. And you can meet somebody in Brazil and you've just met them a few days ago or maybe even the same day and they still treat you as if you had known each other for a really long time, right? You don't really get that kind of warmth with Argentine people. So what the Argentinians would say in response to that is that, yes, it takes longer to build relationships, but the relationships you'll have are for life and authentic. And they're not these, you know, uh, friendships of convenience that you, you make, you know, on your vacation in, in Brazil and so on. So, you know, it's like ice cream. Every, everybody's got a different flavor. So a lot of people really love it down there. I mean, Palermo is absolutely gorgeous. Um, that's the neighborhood where the vast majority of uh, expats and digital nomads live in. Um, yeah, the weather's a little bit cool from June uh, to early October, but it's really not that bad most of the year. Um, and they're very warm and, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to, I think it's easier to stay in Buenos Aires by doing visa runs and finding different ways to stay. And another thing about Brazil is you need to find a reason to stay, right? You can't, you can't just leave every six months, just hop the border, right? You either need to get a digital nomad visa or a student visa. You know, I'm lucky enough to have an Argentine passport, so I don't have to have a reason to be in Brazil. And another thing to be aware of about Brazil is I don't know when this goes into effect, but Brazil has a new president. And one of the first things that they did is reinstate visas for all the countries that require visas for Brazilians, which is essentially the vast majority of um, first world countries, uh, including the U.S. So if you want to go to Brazil and you're American visa free without having to make an appointment, I think you would need to do so within the next few months. I don't know. Maybe Vance, maybe you know when that kicks in. Yeah, I'm not sure. I thought maybe it already did, but or maybe it's, it just a, did. it's just a $150 visa on arrival. So it's not a real visa. But oh, it's yeah. on arrival? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just at the airport, $150. Bucks, uh, similar to how Paraguay used to be. Um, but it creates like maybe a little bit of a barrier to entry, um, which can be sort of good to keep the, 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 the fair weather nomads out, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, bro. I was like, I feel like I just spent two fifty or something like that on a Bali visa for for two months. I mean, it's it's nothing if you you know you you calculate it out over a few months, right? I mean, it's like you know yeah. you stay for three months, it's fifty bucks a month. Two fifty, two hundred fifty bucks. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I do the uh, the B two one one A visa when I okay. go to Bali for two months offshore. And then if I stay longer, I just keep extending it every two months for up to six months. So it just lets me be flexible. And uh, yeah, man, it's kind of like my 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 cheat code. Because when you land in Bali, there's like a huge line for the VOA. And I just don't want to stand in that. Uh -huh. Just walk straight to the controls. Yeah. That's cool. Well, Desmond, I'd love to get a little bit more of your story. And, and thanks, Freddie, for the breakdown coming from a Argentine-American dual citizen. I think that was a good, good breakdown. Um, so you said that like you kind of want to keep Southeast Asia as one of your bases and you're looking for a second base in Latin America. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Quick break from the podcast to tell you about Language Blend, the best new way to learn Spanish. Language Blend was co-founded by Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast, 
decade of experience in Latin America. And Jake and his team, they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills. Because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. Dude, yeah, man. Um, when I first started traveling, I had, I mean, I was just, I literally just opened up a map on my computer and just start looking at countries and then YouTube videos. I'm like, oh, what's, what does this place look like? Does it have a beach? Right. And then obviously as you keep traveling, you start to like notice little inconveniences. Like, is there, you know, like stores and gyms and, um, you know, restaurants, things like that. And uh, I would have to say after I left Europe, um, for the first time I went to Asia, I start to really understand the power of regional travel. So like I love staying in Bangkok and Bali, preferably more Bangkok, because you're able to fly almost anywhere in Asia, not just Southeast Asia. Like I went to Japan, you know, if I had more time, I would have went to South Korea and Taiwan. Um, but it's easy to get to Vietnam. It's easy to get to Indonesia. It's even easy to get to Australia. And I really enjoyed it because... Um, you know, I got to enjoy the conveniences of a big city, but then I got to change up my environment and just go explore, right? And when I usually go and travel, I have zero plans. Like I literally land at the airport and just, I just book an Airbnb or a hotel and I just figure out everything from there. Then I post on Instagram, my, my stories. And then I met so many amazing travelers and entrepreneurs, both online and offline, that my DMs just get flooded with like, ideas and things to see so then i have like you know I'm, I'm here for like two to four days in the city that i'm hitting and like i feel like everyone's on this journey with me give me ideas and it's just a sense of adventure right and um so that's that's a little bit like how i do it and i think it's like less stress-free because when i first started out i um i was trying to plan everything and it just created more stress and it wasn't as fun like i had fun don't get me wrong but it that sense of adventure and just like going with the flow um, wasn't there until I just started to stop planning and let <laughs> let my community help me out a little bit and just kind of vibe, man. Um, but yeah, dude, I, I think I'm 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 kind of on my transition phase now, where I've already been to 30 countries. I think I don't even know, man. It's been I've been to pretty much most of the countries on my bucket list, mm -hmm. and I'm really just at the point now where I'm like, I guess considering expatting. So thinking of like, okay, where do I want to get residency? You know, where do I want to get long term visas for and where do I really want to spend in my time and get deeper relationships with. And so that's why I'm going to Latin America, Latin America to explore that sometime, probably in December or January. But I'm for sure living in Bangkok for at least three or four months of the year. I love it there. Um, spend a couple months in Bali, then six months in Latin America. So that's kind of my in my mind, my plan, unless, you know, I don't like Latin America, then I guess I'll figure it out from there. But um that's kind of my my strategy so far yeah i like that doing it totally international and um you might be surprised to hear this from the from vance uh, of my latin life but i don't think that everyone needs to be a, a latin america purist i think it's totally chill to spend part of your year in europe or in asia and just you know use latin america as an excellent residency or uh playground country and Latin America can fill a lot of different use cases and you have so many countries in the region. And uh, yeah, so I think, you know, we, we appreciate kind of global digital nomad travel. Random question, Desmond, did you do the Thai elite visa? I did not, man. I haven't done any long-term visas yet because I've been usually staying in places two to three months. Um, but I am considering it. I, dude, I'm in a situation right now where my passport's running out of pages and I have less than 18 months on it. So I need a new passport. So I can't even get any pass. I can't get any visa even if I wanted to right now because I need to get my passport renewed. I got a new passport. Mm. You know, you can get a second U.S. passport, right? I, I just found that out. Yes. So I'm for sure getting a, a new one while I'm in Bali. But I think I'm like, I might. I haven't looked into it yet. I mean, can I can I get a two at the same time as I get a renewal or is that possible, you think, or what? I, I think you get the second. I, I actually haven't done it. But I think um, you probably want to physically have one, right? Like always on you. And so the idea, the idea, and, and this is unique, that 
America is one of the only countries where you can actually have two American passports because I guess they want to encourage Americans to be able to travel and do business around the world and take over, <laughs> etc. Mm -hmm. And so they say like they understand that there's this idea that sometimes you literally need to send your passport out in order to like in the mail in order to get a visa or, or things like that. And so that's why you can potentially order a second U.S. passport so you can send one out to get a visa. So I don't know all the details like in and in, in and out because I have multiple passports, so I don't actually have to deal with that overly. Um, but yeah, that could that, that, would, that would probably make sense for you, I think. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely down for that. I know Mexico as well has like that that uh, temporary residency and a kind of a path as well. Like, yep. I, I'm definitely at the point where I know that I'm not living back in America ever again, and I'm a pretty young guy, so I'm 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 trying to be more strategic with okay, what do I want my life to look like? You know, what you know, passports or residencies make sense. I thought yeah. about opening up a business in Asia as well to do business there, like an LLC or a structure there as well, um, and get visas through that. Right. I think that Thailand, you could do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 10K or something like that. Um, but yeah, what were you going to say, Freddie? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was basically going to say what you're saying about Mexico. Um, yeah, it's a great place to get residency as well. Even if you don't have residency and you don't want to spend, you know, three to four weeks or six to eight weeks, however long it's going to take your passport in the U.S., Mexico is a great place to renew your passport as well. So I had renewed mine last year. It was the same thing that happened uh, to you. I mean, all my pages were full. And at the time, it was like early to mid-2022. And everyone was freaking me out that there's like six, 12-month delays. And I should go ahead and cancel future travel and all this BS. And uh, I just mailed a passport at DHL to the embassy here in Mexico City. They got it the next day and it wasn't even a month. Maybe it was three weeks later. I already got my passport um, sent to me and I didn't even have to do an appointment. Right. I just I they you print out some form. You go to DHL. DHL provides you with the envelope that you need. It goes to the embassy. Um, and then they mail you the new passport to your address in Mexico, which could be an Airbnb or, or a friend's place. And you, and you don't need residency. And I don't know how long it takes in Brazil or Argentina or Thailand to renew your passport. But I imagine it could take a while because in the vast majority of cases, when you're mailing your passport, they don't like just give you one on the spot. I think that's just for emergency passports. So what they do is they mail the passport back to Washington, D.C., um, and then they have to mail it all the way back, right? So if you're doing that in Thailand or any of these other countries, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I would imagine it would take a, a good bit longer, right? So my experience renewing here in Mexico is really good. And this was when they still had a little bit of a backlog um, because of COVID. I think now a year later, it would be even faster and you could get it done in uh, maybe two weeks, three weeks until they send it back, right? Just because of the geographic um, it's just so close Mexico to the U S so they can get that passport sent pretty quick. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk on Twitter about how it's a lot easier to renew your American passport at an embassy abroad versus in the States. I may or may not be, uh, American uh, as a semi anonymous guy, but if I was, I might've sent out my passport like last week of March, first week of April within the U S to the like headquarters in Virginia or whatever it is. And I'm still waiting on it. Like, I don't, I don't like, it's still out there and it's been close to 10 weeks with no word on it. Um, and apparently it takes 10 to 13 weeks. So I, I, I almost have to wait another month still before I can even start worrying. And that's already been like 10 weeks. So, uh, good tip for all the listeners out there renewing your U S passport and an embassy can can definitely be the way to go it definitely sounds like it's the way to go anecdotally uh at, at basically any embassy because if anything you'd think that the mexican embassy freddie would be like the busiest because there's like an, a million americans in mexico but if it's still getting done there in just a couple of weeks like that's that's excellent compared to doing it it's, it's ironic because supposedly according to them officially all they do is is forward your passport to the same office or whatever that you would have shipped it to anyways from the u.s <laughs> Suppo supposedly no i don't think so they have passport booklets in the embassies 
Do you think they you, printed but... it in the? Well, okay. Well, maybe they they lied. They do. They do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they do. Um, they they send the like the passport booklets like without. I could actually be totally wrong on this, but I believe that they send the passport booklets to all the embassies, but they're like basically blank on the inside, or they don't have the photo in in the, that primary you know user information page. But they send out the blank passports to the embassies. And then the embassy does like the printing of the, you know, the user information page with the photo. I could be wrong on that. I really should look that up. Bro, yeah. it's a black box, man. It's a black box. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> yeah, man. A month ago, I was freaking out. I was like, man, do I have to go back to America? Do I like, what if I get stuck in a country waiting on my passport? Do I get like penalized? Like what, what? Yeah, it was um, it was stressful, man, because you got to make your future plans based off of like what countries you can get into. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Six months from expiration, at least to get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man, um, I found out, dude, you help you, bro. You you are the man, bro, because I think you sent me a DM of like, yo, I can introduce you to someone if you need help with so and so. And I was like, man, this is this, like this is what's up. Um, and then I found out that Bali, um, Indonesia takes like two to three weeks or something like that, like one to three weeks to get it renewed. So I like instantly bought my ticket to Bali, bro. Like didn't even hesitate, like, boom, I'm going to go chill in Bali while I get my password renewed. like apply for a visa, easy peasy, man. Um, man, have you, have, have you guys, uh, been to Bali yet or no? Just curious. Yeah, I've been a few times. Freddie was quick with it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done as much of Asia as I would like to. Got it, got it. Oh man, hopefully we can hopefully we can change that soon. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean to be the travel hipster, but I do feel Bali got kind of played out. It's not <laughs> as good a good of an option as as it used to be. I just remember I went once in 2015 and it was so rural and still not really on the map. And I was in this What's the neighborhood after Semen? Yeah, Ch Changu, I think what it's called. I, I was staying in Changu, uh, just doing some surfing classes. And there was like nothing there. Just a few palapas, people doing coconuts. I came back two years later, 2017. Not that much. Like two, it was completely transformed. Like all these like buildings went up. Everybody's talking. I can't even imagine now. Well, may maybe uh, maybe it's a little bit quieter now because I, I guess post – Post COVID, a lot of people, you know, I I feel one change that's happened, and and one of the reasons I think Vance is having so much success with this podcast is pre COVID, the center of this digital nomadism or whatever you want to call it was really centered around Thailand and Southeast Asia in general, right? Bangkok, Chiang Mai, to a lesser extent, Saigon, Bali, and then with Southeast Asia being closed for uh, more than two years. Uh, everybody ended up in Playa del Carmen, Mexico City, Medellin. Those are the big ones. Buenos Aires now too. And I'm just curious. I mean, since since you've been in Asia recently, I haven't been since 2019. I'm, I'm going back later this year. Like, ha has have the people started returning? Is it is it more crowded? Are there more Ferengs oh, than before or less? Or, or what's the deal? Like, what's what's going on there, bro? It's definitely packed. Uh, Thailand is definitely on fire. Um, I travel pretty much everywhere in Thailand. Bali's definitely pretty crowded. I mean, I know some people love like the, the more royal vibes, but I mean, personally for me, bro, I like all the coffee shops, all the infrastructure, like give me all of that. And then I can escape into, you know, the quietness when I'm not in my, my grind mode or, or get paper mode. Um, so I, I personally love, like, that's why I love like Bangkok or big cities. Like Lisbon is pretty, it's great and all, like, I'm not trying to, you know, change the subject here, but um, it's just not busy enough, right? Like, I kind of like a little bit of that, like, slight luxury. I hate to say it, I sound like, I don't sound like, you know, you know, peppy or anything like that, but I like the little, the finer things of life, right? Um, and so I like that about Bali. I know some people don't, and they're talking about the prices, but dude, it's still so cheap, man. Like, it's like 3K a month, you can live a pretty good life, right? Um but yeah, man, it's it's definitely crowded, definitely tons of Aussies and a bunch of Ukrainians and Russians are flooding Southeast Asia right now because of the oh, war, right? Yeah, yeah. Bunch of, yeah. you know, Slavic people. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I'll be excited to see how it's changed. I, I agree with you. Bangkok is by far my favorite city in Southeast Asia. I mean, there's just so much going on there. If you want to just slum it and, and backpack and, you know, ch- chill on Khao San Road and eat street food, you can do that. If you want to go to five-star uh, restaurants and, and there's all these, uh, you know, what I really like about Bangkok that Mexico City doesn't have is all these like rooftop bars with just like gorgeous decorations and like good like mixology and drinks. Like you, you can do Bangkok all the way from the cheapest to you know just just living it up uh like just um, amazing quality of life and it's a great airport i mean you got the bkk airport then you also have the dmk airport they have direct flights to you know practically everywhere in europe and asia um they they started a north america flight now too um actually this will be interesting for for vance they're doing um bangkok to van uh, vancouver now direct flight so they have they have they have direct flights to uh, North America now too, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a really cool place. The only thing about me for Southeast Asia, why I chose Latin America, is I, I don't know how much like ties you have to the U.S. like business wise or family and stuff like that, but I like being close to the U.S. It's only a two and a half hour flight from Mexico City to where I grew up. If there's a last minute business conference or family event, I can easily make it. I think one thing that you give up when you make uh, Southeast Asia or Asia in general, your base is you can't really pop in a Europe or, or North America just on a, on a dime's notice. I, I guess maybe if you're Australian, Bali's like sort of relatively close by Australian standards, but for everybody else, you know, all these places are super, super far. Right. So um, I, I, I don't know how much like you mm-hmm. care about that. And, and I, I know that Thailand as well, and maybe even in Bali now too, they have a lot of their own SEO and business and digital marketing conferences as well. But one thing I've always appreciated about Mexico and unfortunately why it's become so popular and the price has gone up so much is you can continue to have a lot of ties to the U.S. and pop in and out as you please while having a lot of the benefits of living abroad, right? When you're in Bali, that's just impossible, right? I mean, you're going to go home maybe once a year for Christmas and, and that's when you're going home, right? If your mom calls, I'll say, oh, I miss you. Come in for the weekend. You're like, that's that's a 35-hour flight. <laughs> like, you know, I, I can't just pop in like that. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Bro, I think for me, even the reason why I'm in – Europe right now was I I had uh, I do a lot of business with people in United States and some in Europe. And I had one moment where I was on the phone with someone until three o'clock in the morning because of the time zones. I go to bed and then I wake up to a bunch of phone calls from my team at 7 a.m. And I I just snapped, bro. I was like, I I got to I got to get out of here because the time zone was just chipping away at my soul. Right. Like staying up real late and, you know, getting woken up in the mornings. Um, that's literally why I, someone tagged me on a post on LinkedIn, another digital, digital nomad influencer. And he was like, bro, are you going, are you checking this out? The Spain digital nomad visa. And dude, I bought my ticket to Spain that day, bro. Like I broke. <laughs> I was like, you're, all right, you're, I'm you're, you're gonna, we forgot, <laughs> one thing I forgot about Brazil, you're going to love the time zone difference. It's three hours ahead of the U S two to three hours behind Europe. It's halfway between both of them. So it's great when people are starting their day at, uh, you know, 8, 9 a.m. That's like noon Brazil time, right? So you don't have to get up super early to, to hit the Europeans. And if you sleep in, like you wake up at like 10, 11 a.m., you had a big night out, um, you're good because it's like 8 a.m., you know, East Coast time. And Brazil's like really the only country that has that, that time zone. Um, I guess Argentina as well is like maybe an hour or two. I think Argentina's yeah, just East I think Coast. It's the same. I think it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, but Brazil's an hour or two ahead, so that's that's really nice because I'm I'm a bit of a late sleeper. I, I I like that. But yeah, if I forgot to mention, yeah, time zone as well, especially if you're running a a sales team. I think that'd be really difficult to do unless your team's already in Asia as well. Dude, it, it chips away at your soul because the money's in the West, bro. Like you know, like they're the ones who send a twenty five thousand dollar wires on like the, a call. Europeans take months to do business sometimes. Like they're mm-hmm. just so conservative. But yeah, bro, I literally came to Europe to check it out. Like I checked Spain out for their visa. I was like, okay, can I live here as a base? I came here to Lisbon because my one of my buddies is here. He had an extra place here on the beach. I'm like, okay, let me go check out Lisbon. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not fucking, or excuse my language, I'm not staying in Europe. All right, so Latin America uh, is my next best choice, which I'm going to come check out uh, in December or January. I was supposed to come in July, but the weather situation. So I was like, okay, I'll wait, I'll wait till December. 
But um, yeah, man, the time zone is by far the only reason why I won't live in Asia full like year round. Yeah. You like, gotta do like zombie it. hours if you're gonna deal with the yeah. US. You know, it's insane. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's pain. So uh Desmond, there were definitely a couple uh themes that you mentioned that I wanna pick up on. I know we're already pretty far in the episode, so we'll see how far we get, but one of them was that you said um you have no intention of living in the United States again. And I wanted to know uh, what the reasoning behind that was and uh, kind of what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, man, I like the world is such a big place and it's so fascinating to people that it's just really hard for me to go back to America and just pretend that I just don't like, I don't know. Like to me, getting on a plane is like getting on a bus or riding a train, right? It's like nothing, right? And um, the energy sometimes in America, like, dude, I'm a capitalist through and through. I love, I'm, I'm a diehard American. I'll never like actually give up my American citizenship ever. But the politics in the current like woke environment and all this kind of stuff that's happening in America, it's like, I don't want any, any of that energy, bro. I want to go hang out with like normal people who just care about having a good time, chill. Like, you know what I mean? Like, not in this, like, confrontational energy, right? Um, And I, yeah, man, it's just, and I think the people that I've also been meeting around the world, like, I have some really deep relationships with. And I'm like, man, like, I like my tribe. I like the people that are in my life, right? They're also, like, you know, entrepreneurs who travel the world and live in different places. And it's like, those are, like, my people, right? Um. And uh, yeah, man, I just don't see myself going back because I don't think I could relate as deeply with people in America. And then I still do business with Americans, right? Like I'm still doing business. I can do it online. I will go back to America to do like for business, like to go to events or if someone's paying me, you know, 20 grand to do a training, I'll do that, right? They pay for my flight, hotel and all that. But I'm not going to like get an apartment in America and like live there unless, I don't know, something happens within my family or unforeseen right um but I, I love being international and i feel like i'm just getting started bro like i'm just starting to start like i'm just started i just turned 30 bro like i'm like i'm cooking man like i'm just getting started in this adventure and i see it i see where it's going and i want to like play it out to the best i can yeah it's interesting um I, th- I think a lot of people think the same way. Do you think part of it is that you just can't relate to non-digital nomads or, or people without international experience, that things are just more interesting? Because um, we obviously all kind of love a lot of things about America and, and freedom and uh, and stuff like that. But do, do you find like when you go back and visit that you have a harder time relating to uh, like classic, like white picket fence 2.1 kids type people bro people think i'm crazy bro like they like some of my friends and family they like still don't know what i'm doing like they're just like what are you like what it's like you're always on vacation like you're like like they just can't wrap their hand around it and it's like pandora's box bro like there's no way i can go like go pay 5k a month to go live in downtown san diego and just like sit there in my living room and watch Netflix, bro. Like, like <laughs> there's, no, there's like, it's there's like funny. no, there's no way I'm going back to that, bro. Like, absolutely zero shot, right? Maybe Miami and like, but I wouldn't want to live there. I'll just go and like hang out. But bro, there's no way, bro. There's no way I'm going back. Yeah. Even if I get have a family and kids, I'll probably still live abroad. That's another interesting topic. How are you starting to think about that? Like where you think would be like a good environment to, to raise kids abroad? Yeah, man, I definitely want to start a family. Um, I think when, when, you know, as I'm getting more plugged in with more people and, you know, building a tribe and like kind of figuring out where I want to spend most of my time year round, then obviously I will, you know, that would be in my calculus. But um, yeah, man, I definitely want a family. And some of the people, for instance, I want to bring this up, but like in Bali, I met a couple like successful people that exited companies and, you know, there's really cool, like these international schools, right? Like of like people who live abroad and their kids all go to these like, you know, super cool schools. And I probably will want my kid not in the woke American system right now, like with the whole like 
Mm. You know, you know what's going down. I don't need to say it. Like people know what's going down. Like yeah. I don't. I, I think I. I think I would want to raise my kids more in like a more traditional values, right? Um, in hard work, and so like that's yeah, man. That's definitely going to be in my calculus when I like actually you know pick a place to live full time. But uh, for right now, my goal is to get two to four bases. Preferably, the dream scenario would be like that two two cribs, Airbnb them out when I'm not there. Um, I know you had a cool guest on recently. I signed up for their thing to check them out, but yeah, man, like that's my, my ideal, my ideal scenario over the next few years, obviously meet someone, start a family and then just keep vibing and keep living my, you know, my life, right. Keep traveling and and things like that. So that's kind of my, are are you referring to the Tim Hubbard episode? Yeah, I think so. The house, I think it's like house, house world. Oh, world house, world house, world house. Yeah. We're world house. Yeah. The world house episode was pretty good. Nice. You signed up for that. Yeah, bro. Signed up as soon as I heard about it. I was like, what is this? I, I sent it to one of my friends as well because he's like, we're, we're talking about buying something in uh, Thailand. I was like, bro, this is something on my radar. You know, put this in your radar. So when we're back in Bangkok in July, we'll, we'll sit down and like probably go through it and talk about it and stuff like that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think there's there's a big market for doing um, like maybe turnkey property investment in Latin America for people that want to have it as like a bit of a lifestyle investment, live there part of the year rent it out part of the year. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. That's definitely a thing. Yeah, I um, think it's genius. Yeah, we have a couple episodes like that. Um, kind of back to back. This will be a bit dated because it'll come out like a month from now. But there's the Danny Rustin episode, his second episode. There's the Tim Hubbard episode. There's a World House episode. And they're all kind of talking about this kind of uh, Airbnb and short-term rental in Latin America. So we're getting more into, as a podcast, we're definitely getting more into talking about investing in latin america which i didn't have too many investor type people on in the first um you know 50 whatever episodes but it's it's happening more and more because i think that's part of the progression that you mentioned desmond where it's like you start off as a digital nomad just like just go paint the town red tear up the world flight here flight there check out basically a little bit everything see what you like and then you move into more of like an expat vibe where it's like hey let me get you know, one to three to four bases, um, places where I can spend more time, start building a community, build the tribe. And, uh, you know, part of that might be uh, just Airbnb for a longer period of time, but some of that might also be investing in these areas and, you know, getting a condo, getting a house, stuff like that. So I think it's like a natural progression of the, of the digital nomad to the expat. Girl, definitely. Like I'm a thousand percent sure by the end of next year, I'm going to like buy a property like somewhere in the world like by the end of next year in the next 18 months guaranteed what's, up, what's on your radar uh definitely as you may know thailand obviously is on my radar i kind of have a realtor out there that i'm kind of talking with i met her on tinder as funny as that is this but um but then i'm i don't know man latin america is obviously on my radar as well I've, I've been listening to your pod obviously i follow a lot of guys on twitter and um yeah, like so, I'm gonna check out Latin America first. Obviously, I think I'm gonna. I'll spend three months in Colombia, man. I loved it, right? Um, but yeah, I'm gonna check it out, kind of get a it's vibe. Good amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been three months, bro. It was great. It's good amount. Um, <laughs> I, dude, I went to Nicaragua as well for like a month. But this is when I was in corporate. My buddies called me. Like I'm at my desk. I was, I'm in my cubicle, bro. Like I get a text message like, "Bro, you wanna go to Nicaragua next week?" And I'm like. Sure, send it. Like we're I'm like, yeah, I'm going, bro. And my boss had a meeting with my boss the next day and this like big meeting there where I was like, hey, that's what you up to. I just bought a ticket to Nicaragua. And he was like, What? You bought a ticket to Nicaragua? I was like, Yeah, I was gonna put my vacation time in. I didn't even ask him. And uh dude, loved it, man. What a crazy, what a crazy country that is, man. Um, but uh yeah, man, I explore Costa Rica, Nicaragua, the Caribbeans, obviously. Um, but yeah, man, I want to check out Argentina and Brazil. I think the Argentina, like the money thing is kind of like triggering to me. Um, I mean, I carry cash, but I'm not trying to like, you know, I don't know. That's just, I'm not trying to get too deep on that, but yeah, I'm pretty stoked for Brazil. I'm learning Portuguese right now. I got a tutor and I'm learning bachata and oh, cool. all the, yeah, all the people I know here in Lisbon are awesome. Like the, the Brazilian people are like so nice, warm, um, you know, really down to earth. So I'm stoked for Brazil, man. I'm like. Hoping I fall in love with it, and that could be my second base. Um, yeah, that's my yeah. That's my awesome. Hopeful. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Shout out uh, Stephen Story. I, I assume you probably follow him on Twitter. 
Yeah, I definitely follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I follow him. Um, Stakes. I follow Nomada, obviously. Um, I follow. Who else do I follow? Um, what's that? Yeah, I think those are the main guys I follow, actually. Probably some others that I can't think off the top of my head. But I follow a lot of guys from Latin America to just kind of get a peep and like, okay, what's the what are the people like? What are you know, what you know, what's the vibe, things like that. So I'm 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 pretty uh I'm stoked, man, to come check it out and meet some people down there. Hey guys, quick interruption to tell you about bit refill. Bit refill is the best way to convert your crypto into gift card balances. These are gift cards that you can spend at hotels.com, Airbnb, Nike, and many more. You may remember Joel Valenzuela, previous podcast guest. He's been living on crypto exclusively since 2015, and he's a big consumer of BitRefill. And so I asked Joel, I said, what do you like most about BitRefill? He said that he likes the instant delivery, the precise amount so that you don't have to juggle a lot of gift cards, and he loves the global selection. Nobody else has this much selection of gift cards, over 10,000 gift card options across hundreds of countries. Go to bitrefill.com to sign up. And you can also use the code MyLatinLife for 10% back off your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Yeah. I'm starting to hear, this is random, but I'm starting to hear that there is a way to get a CPF, CPF without um, being a Brazilian resident. And that's something I might want to start looking into as well because... It's true that you are sort of limited in terms of what you can do in weird ways without having that number. I remember I didn't have too I didn't have too much trouble compared to the anecdotes that I'm hearing, but I, I do remember there was one time I was in Sao Paulo a couple of years ago and I wanted to go to like the most famous museum in Sao Paulo. Then the name's escaping me right now. Masby, something like that, but it's like the big one. It's like boxy. It's kind of red and glass. It's like the the, the most famous museum in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the Masby. 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 Cool. And um, and I go on the website to buy the tickets, and it was like mandatory field CPF. And I'm like, what? Like, is, is this really not? Is this form really not set up for like international ticket buyers? Like, what is going on right here? <laughs> so, um. To be determined, I might have to extend the my Latin life services to help people get these. Bro, I remember CPFs. the first time I was in Brazil. Well, I went one time with my family in 2004 when I was a teenager. But my first time traveling there alone in 2010, uh, 2011, it was so much worse. I remember one time I went to a department store to buy a fan, just a, just a simple fan to cool me off. And they couldn't check me out. They're like, dude, we, we can't check you out without your CPF like I was like, what? Like, I, it's gotten better, but um, you still can't activate a SIM card without a SIP FE. Um, there's still certain things you can't do without a, a SIP FE. You can't buy certain tickets. Like if you wanted to go to a show, a concert, museum, basically almost really just buying almost anything online, you need a SIP FE. One of the coolest things that you can do with the SIP FE is, so uh, this is a cool little arbitrage here. Um, domestic flights in Brazil in dollars are at a different price, like LATAM uh, and yeah, Gol and Compared Azul. to if a Brazilian was looking yeah, at that. So, so, yeah, so if a Brazilian wants to buy the ticket, it's like 400 reais. But if you want to buy the ticket, it's like $400. <laughs> so if you have a SIP FE, I'm pretty sure that you can get the Brazilian price on plane tickets. So really, in summary, Brazilian, Brazil is made for Brazilians. It's not made for <laughs> foreigners. They don't care. I was reading a statistic somewhere that Brazil gets 6 million international tourists a year in a country of 200 and something million compared to 90 million a year in Mexico for a country of half the population. Yeah, so Dominican it, Republic it, gets like <laughs> 17x the international yeah. and it's like one two hundred. So if you size? do the simple math, for every one foreigner in Me in Brazil, there's thirty in Mexico. <laughs> Dude, I there was one map I shared a long time ago. Now, um, I wish I should almost post it again, but it was like number of foreign visitors per state in Brazil, and they they did it, and it was like some of the lesser known states like Tocantins and stuff like that, Campo Grande. It was literally like. 10,000 visitors 
for the entire state for the entire year. And these are like massive states that could basically be countries. And it was like 10,000 visitors in a year versus like even like North Macedonia or something is is like any European country. Is yeah, like I mean, once you're outside of Rio, Sao Paulo, to a slightly lesser extent, Floripa and Salvador, it's it's pretty common. You won't see any foreigners uh, at all. I mean, your your entire trip. Um, and when you when you do, you're actually kind of shocked. You're like, what the heck are you? How did how did you get here? Like, how did, what's your story? It's like, bro, what's your story? Like, how did you know, like it's, it's, uh, yeah. It, so, so not only is the Brazil only got 6 million compared to 90 million from Mexico, but 97% of those tourists are Argentina. basically concentrate. Yeah. Well, Argentinian as well, but also just concentrate. Rio gets a fair bit of tourists, um, obviously, but they're all concentrated in Rio and to a lesser extent, Sao Paulo and Floripa, right? That's like 10% of the country. The other 90%, uh, you know, you're, like you're on your own and yeah. It's yeah. Final frontier, that in Venezuela, final frontiers yeah. of Latin America. Yeah, I, 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 I know, I know this is Latin life and not Asia life. But since uh, since Desmond brought up Bali, if you go back to Bali, there was one of the most fun trips. I, I, I know you're a base guy and not like a vacation travel guy, but just in case you change your mind, there is a really really fun ten day trip that I did. That was the most fun in my life was starting in Jakarta and working my way east on that island until you hit Bali, right? And just cross by ferry, right? And just mm -hmm. go between trains and motorbikes. There's so much crazy stuff to see. There's this there's this place in the middle of Java called Bor Borbador. I don't know if it's pronounced uh, exa exactly that way, but it's basically three times the size of Angkor Wat, as impressive as Angkor Wat, if not more so. And there's no tourists there at all. Right. And people were asking to take photos with me. Uh, and I'm not even like, you know, <laughs> like I, I don't, I'm kind of short guy. I'm not like, I'm not like some tall blonde haired blue eyed guy, whatever that's used to that. I'm like, they, they have never seen foreigners before, you know, outside of Bali and, and lesser extent Jakarta. And there's like mountains you can climb and there's this volcano. I think it's called Mount Bromo at the very east side of the island where you can walk up all the way to the caldera, the volcano. I mean, in the US, they would never let you do this. Even in Mexico, as loose as the country is, they would never let you. You can walk up to the caldera where all the smoke is coming out and it's like a constant earthquake shaking or like the smoke's like hitting your face. And I'm like, man, I can't believe they're letting people do this. Like, this is so <laughs> dangerous. Um, and it's a, it's a really fun trip and there's like a lot of cool, like different foods and stuff. So I don't know, maybe next time you go to Bali, just start in Jakarta and, and, and work East for a week. I think Java was really underrated and it's kind of like that. Um, but Brazil is definitely like that. I mean, people are so excited to see a foreigner there. A lot of them may, may have not even met an American in their entire life. And so when you start speaking English, they're like freaking out like, oh, you sound like in the movies because, you know, in the movies they speak neutral American English and we speak neutral American English. And it's like, wow, or you're a movie star. It's like, it's, it's, it feels like kind of like a time warp, like going 40, 50 years back in time before, you know, mass tourism and, and all this stuff where, where people were still excited to see foreigners. So I, I really like that about Brazil and it's really cool that you're uh, learning Portuguese and, and that's the thing. Most foreigners are lazy, man. They just want to go to, you know, uh, Bangkok or the Philippines uh, where everything is easily set up for them. Or I guess now Playa del Carmen too, um, and not put in the work or whatever. But if you put in the work and learn the language and culture and, and learn how to keep yourself safe in Brazil, because it's not, the safest country, you know, the, 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 the treasure, the cultural treasure that awaits you is, is worth the work. I think. Bro, mm -hmm. I'm plugged in, man. I'm plugged in. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to control my excitement. I'm just like, all right, let's just stay focused. Three months, just wait three months. I might stop in South Africa on the way there. Um, just because, you know, to see Cape town, but I don't know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to control my excitement to explore a new continent. Um, and just stay present, bro. Because if not, I'll fumble the bag <laughs> if I get too excited. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Desmond, do you feel like because sales is so internet heavy that just in terms of like Zoom video calls that you're a little bit limited in terms of locations and you really like have to stay in the city and double check that you have good internet? 
Definitely, bro. I would be spending more time in Istanbul if the internet wasn't so bad. Cause I love also Turkey. I went there four times last year. Um, love the city. It's amazing. But um, yeah, man. But you also make money in real life too. Like I meet people as well. To, like I like staying in places where there's like social activities and it's like, you know, you can go on ventures and have good internet. Right. And so when you mentioned like people don't speak English and stuff, I'm, I'm like mentally preparing myself to be immersed in a different world where, <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's not, I don't have this, the conveniences that I'm used to. Right. Which, you know, I'm starting to mentally prepare for, but yeah, I need good internet, bro. Like that's, a non-negotiable yeah, I, I, for me. I wonder how many years we are from a portable Starlink. Uh, I, I kind of had an image in my mind of one of those 1980s executives with those giant cell phones that were like the size of uh, like a briefcase, but like the modern day version, like the guy with the Starlink, like just <laughs> hanging out in some tiny beach town in in Brazil. I, I will say the internet in a lot of these places has gotten way better, but not quite as good that you would want to be doing sales calls, right? Cause you wouldn't want to fumble a $25,000 deal because suddenly nope. the internet went out, you know? So for super dependable internet, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, man. I, I think you're, you're going to be stuck in the big cities and, and you know, one, one thing I've noticed about being a digital nomad for almost a decade now, I just want to say, I want to say over a decade now is a lot of people think the internet's bad in certain places because the coffee shop and the Airbnb has bad internet. But oftentimes, I, I, the perfect example of this is Manila in the Philippines. So people will complain about the internet there. But if you stay there for six months or whatever and you get an Airbnb, you can contact the host or if you sign a lease – uh, you'll find out that the, the top level internet or fiber, whatever it is, um, which is only maybe $100 a month or something like that, or even a little bit less, is actually really, really fast. Just nobody wants to pay for it, right? So in Mexico, uh, in, in any place you go at the coffee shop or the Airbnb, I, I know these people, they always get the very cheapest internet package, mainly because the business owners think that the internet is not important. And literally to get just a little bit faster internet would cost some of these businesses only 10 or $20 a month more, almost nothing. But they're like, oh, nobody cares about that. What's the difference, 10? So they don't even understand, you know, 10 meg, 20 meg. So, um, you know, you got to check uh, what's, what's, what's going on there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a strategy I've used a lot is, you know, either find an Airbnb that already guarantees you good internet. Or um, once once you move in there, or just ask them in advance, like, hey, can we upgrade from you know the, the ten or twenty meg package to the uh, you know two hundred meg package, whatever it is, and then always have you know multiple multiple SIM cards. You know, one hack I have on my iPhone is so I have my Wi-Fi. Then I have my Verizon chip, which gives me access to Telcel and Movistar. They're the two main networks. But just in case when I'm traveling, I also have a Mexican. Not, not a U.S. AT&T, but the Mexican AT&T is a different company on an eSIM as well. So a lot of times, you know, even if you only have one physical SIM chip, you might be able to have a SIM for, you know, I mean, for somebody doing sales, you you should have a activated SIM for every network that's offered in that city, right? Um, so if one goes down, you hop on the other. If that one goes down, you hop on the other and, and you have multiple backup points and, and that should take care of you. Bro, if you're good, you just figure it out. I mean, as long as I got 4G, I'm good, bro. Like, that's it. Um, <laughs> as long as I got my phone, I'm good. Because you can always close on your phone as well. Like, audio only mm. or whatever, which I've done before. Yeah. One, one hack for Brazil when you get there, because you're, you're going to be pulling your hair out in frustration trying to activate your SIM is use, uh, there's this company called Aerolo now. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Oh it's, yeah, um, bro. I gave them so much money, bro. I spent a hundred dollars. <laughs> I probably yeah. spent hundred dollars a month on data, bro. <laughs> yeah, so I I did. Yeah, I did the same thing. I was Brazil. I was like, oh my god, I don't have to. Literally, it's like a two or three day task to deal with the sim because you buy the chip, but then you have to convince somebody to give you the sim. is kind of like a social security number, right? So not only do you know they're asking you're asking some random stranger your random uh, Tinder date for you know basically their social security number, but it also needs like their date of birth and the address then verify it. And then, you know, adding the credits and all this stuff can be kind of complicated too. And now with Aerolo, 
Um, I just, uh, boom, press the button. I have internet. The only issue I had with that the last time I was in Brazil is they don't use Uber Eats or Rappi there. They use this thing called iFood. That's uh, what they use. And you needed a Brazilian phone number to, there's always, a, like, literally, this is perfect example of Brazil. Like I, I'm just trying to order some takeout and I can't figure it out because I don't have a Brazilian number and I don't have a Brazilian number because I had to use Aerolo and I used Aerolo because I didn't want to deal with a two day fiasco of going to different uh, cell phone providers and you have to wait in line. And then, so they don't sell the SIM cards in the kiosk. Uh, you have to go to the store or whatever. And then, you know, they're in shock, right? Because it's, it's definitely the first time a foreigner has been in uh, in their shop. And I, I don't know. You don't have a set Befi. I, I can't help you. So you'll see, man. You'll, you'll be all right, man. You'll uh, be, be ready for hard Bro, work. I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to make my life easier and just get the Brazilian digital nomad visa. So that mm-hmm. I can like get the set pay, bro. Oh, <laughs> I can yeah. make my life uh, apparently, it takes a long time to process, uh, like six months, something like that to process. Six so months? Would, yeah. So I would get started. Like right now? Yeah. Okay. Let me put that on my itinerary next week. Um, yeah. Crazy. We, I, we can introduce you to someone too. I can help. Dope. We'll love that. Uh, switching gears a little bit. Uh, I think part of the reason I wanted to have this sort of like dynamic group discussion and have Freddie on and just kind of have some bro time was because I noticed that you had done a lot of podcasts in the past, Desmond, and I didn't want to just rehash kind of stuff that you may might have already said or gone through on your podcast. It looks like even recently you've been almost doing like a podcast every week or two. Do you want to just tell us kind of what's up with the press tour and just kind of how all these podcasts came about? Because I, I was just kind of curious about that. Yeah, man, dude, I first started podcasting uh, to really just stay connected to the West as I was traveling. It was like my version of networking and also learning from like really smart people as well. And um, yeah, it just turned into more like people started asking, hey, will you come on the pod and talk? And yeah, and um, I wanted to uh, speak more. So I started to speak um, at some events and really my next I guess level as a, as a professional is just really just getting on more stages and just, you know, giving as much game away as possible to help as many people as possible. And dude, I, I love this, man. Like I can, I, I'm a sales guy. I love to talk and I can, I can literally like do podcasts all day, bro. Um, but yeah, I'm actually just got plugged in with a new client that does a lot of speaking stuff um, with some of the, you know, the top speakers in the world. And um, so you guys should pro- probably be here, see me on stage or hear me on stage here to end the year, um, nice. a couple stages. But um, yeah, man, I, I, like, I love it, bro. I think that it's a really good way to do business and to, you know, really learn from smart people and ask them questions and, you know, vibe and things like that. And then I, I'm a huge fan of connecting people at the end of podcasts, right? So for instance, bro, like I'll probably like, you know, now that I know you and, and, and you know, I'm a big believer in your mission. Dude, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you win, bro. If that's like sending people your way or the nomads I meet or like if I was like, yo, this dude is very interesting. He's not very public, but he does a lot of dope stuff behind the scenes. You, you maybe should check him out for an interview. Like, dude, I'm going to connect you with people, right? Um, so that's also another of my favorite things about podcasting is like you just vibe with people and you just help them win, right? Mm-hmm. No, I like that a lot. Um, how Like wh- where are all the leads coming from in terms of – the invites is it more LinkedIn? Is it more Twitter? Is it somewhere else? And then, I guess uh, the speaking engagements too. That's a pretty interesting realm. Are you kind of applying and kind of networking yourself? Is it falling in your lap? I'd love to just hear more about this stuff. Oh yeah, dude, I'll plug you in. So uh, LinkedIn is where I do get a lot of my stuff. Like I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Not as much recently because I'm just super busy. But yeah, man, LinkedIn sliding into the DMs. Dude, I'm a big fan of what's called the Dream 100 list. So you just build a list of 100 people, 100 podcasts that you want to get on or speak, you know, vibe with the podcast host. And you just like reach out to them like, hey, I love episode about one, two, three. I would love to do an episode with you about ABC. Got time for a quick chat or where do I sign up? Right. And then it'll go check you out. And then they're like, OK, here's the link or here's a call. Let's jump on a call. Like it's easy. Like. Two out of three people, if you approach them correctly and if you like are a credible person, they're going to let you on their podcast. And then you could just simply ask them after the podcast, hey, do you know any other great podcasts that I'll be a good like I'll be a good guest for? And then they'll just personally introduce you to people. 
Like mm. it's crazy, bro. It, it's crazy how that works. Um, in terms of like speaking engagements, you just gotta you gotta just network, man. Like it's crazy, bro. Like I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm not gonna tell you a story, but I'm gonna just keep, paint, yeah, point hit us with it. Out. Hit us with it. I'm gonna hit you with some game, right? So I reach out to a young lady about like her coming on my podcast at the time. I'm actually starting another one pretty soon called Sales Church, but we can talk about that later. Um, hallelujah, right? Amen. Let's bring it in, right? Just pass a collection basket around. But um, long story short, I was I reached out to this chick about getting on my show. We were both busy, didn't work out. I sent I commented on her post on LinkedIn. She then DM'd me like, hey, I need a sales guy. Like, let's talk. Then I go on, I give her a sales guy. We vibe. She introduced me to her best friend here in Europe. I meet her. We're not a good fit. I didn't, I didn't make her an offer, but she introduced me to her friend that lived in Bali. I talked with her. We weren't a good fit. But then she introduced me to another person that then introduced me to someone that now is my client. And now I'm helping them with 25K offers and like going to get on stage, right? And I'm like plugged into like this like back-end people that you'll never have. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's crazy how it all started with me reaching out to someone about a podcast. And then it just turned into this like, introduce like people just network like they just introduce you to people as long as you're genuine and like i didn't do business with two of those people but i was genuine enough where i was like man i think you can be valuable to this person let me introduce you to them and it's just like this telephone effect and it's just the power of networking bro and i think that was over a eight month span um so i think networking is powerful in this space by far yeah that's that's awesome and that's that's cool of you to admit that you're also kind of actively asking for for podcast guest spots. I guess just to like put the record out there, I invited you, Desmond. I just kind of DM'd you and on on Twitter, and, and we did it that way. But I think there's you know nothing wrong with asking to kind of invite yourself on as well, because you know you're you're providing value, you're providing your time, and your your interesting perspective. So it's totally chill. I, I yeah, it's 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 cool. Dude, and, I think and, it, sorry, and I was, I was just gonna say, and you're uh, you're also kind of building your authority as uh, as a salesman and as a sales leader. So obviously, that's something that everyone should be doing is building authority in their domain. Absolutely, bro. It's so easy. You just gotta ask, man. Most people will say yes, but if you're credible, right, they're gonna check you out. But eighty percent of the people on podcasts probably have asked to some degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've had a couple of pitches, but I really just didn't, I, I, I really do most of the outreach myself. And uh, I just say like, hey, you want to come on? And if they go, sure, then I just send them the link. And it's easy, as easy as that. I don't do any like screening call or anything. Do people do that? Do people like get you on a call first and be like, just to like feel you out? It depends. I do personally before I bring people on minds, but like, you know, I just want to like make sure they can talk about you know, figure out their angle, right? Like I'm very intentional. I'm a relationship guy. So like, I just want to vibe with you first uh, because some people will come on the podcast and start to do a webinar and like, just like, <laughs> I just hate that, bro. Like I was, I was about to say, uh, that's what I like about your podcast, Vance, is that most of the speakers are just normal people like me that, you know, they don't necessarily go on podcasts for a living or, or, um, you know, they're, they're not there to promote anything. You just hear different stories and different ways of how people have managed to make living in Latin America work. And I, I think that's, you know, really cool because a lot of times it's just like Dustin was saying, it just sounds like you listen to a podcast and it, it almost sounds like, you know, a low key sales pitch, you know, and it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's like, <laughs> it's it's not what a podcast should be all about. I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with promoting. I think, you know, if someone has a uh, something they're selling or that's fine, but, you know, the general gist of it is that when you're listening to pod, you want to learn something and, and get some cool ideas. And, you know, a lot of times I feel with these, you know, professional guests that do all, all the loops or whatever, a lot of times you're, you're missing that. So I, I think it's cooler when you do the outreach because, then you know they're not necessarily people that you know. Let's be honest, right? We're all like we so said, we're all capitalists, right? If they're reaching out to do a podcast, maybe they just like going on, but probably they have something to promote, right? And the podcast can kind of turn into a you know low key webinar that it kind of bores people. So I, I really like that strategy, Vance. No, very cool, very cool. And Desmond, do you find that you're getting more into the like digital nomad scene or it's like, it's a balance, right? Cause you're doing like the sales scene 
and the closer scene and then also the digital nomad scene or how do you think about it bro i just vibe bro like i <laughs> have no strategy like like my team literally try like they like are pulling my teeth on bro you should do more marketing you should do this you should do that and I'm just like, I'm just going to talk what I'm going to talk about. No filter. I don't really care. Sometimes I get in trouble with clients for not having to, you know, a, you know, being politically correct. Cause I'll just like say what's on my mind and just be real, bro. Like I, I have no, like, let me just be clear guys. I have no marketing strategy. I'm just a guy just trying to get value. And like, I literally get a lot of my success from helping other people win. And then they just introduce me to people, bro. And then like, that's it. And then I just have a skill, which is selling like that's, that's it. So if you have an abundant mindset where you're like, okay, how can I add value to other people's lives? Like the universe, not to get all like wooey and stuff, but like things will come in your life that you won't even expect, bro. Like expect, bro. Like I'm excited for tomorrow because who knows what messages I'm going to wake up to, bro. I get excited looking at my phone when I wake up. I'm like, okay, who, who, who sent me a referral or like, you know what I mean? Like who sent me good news about their life has been changed, right? Like that's what's the fun part, man. I, I And I'm, I'm like, I'm like that with relationships as well. Like even when I travel, like I met some really cool people online. I think 60% of my friends around the world, I met them online first. And then we met up in real life, like in a random country, sometimes multiple times. And like, that's kind of like what works for me, right? You meet people on accident, like doing similar things, but I'm not very, let's say intentional, unless I'm curious. Like right now I'm curious about Latin America because I'm considering as a base, it's a big life decision. So I'm like, okay, who are the people in Latin America? It seems like a lot of guys are on Twitter in Latin America. So let me just like consume their content a little bit and like vibe and kind of get, get a feel for the land. Like I just follow my curiosity. Like that's how I build my business. That's how I build my life. It just makes life on easy mode for me. Very cool. Um, Freddie, any any kind of thoughts or questions before we start wrapping it up? Oh uh, no, no, I'm good. I'm just uh, excited on on Desmond's behalf uh, for his upcoming Brazil adventure. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> All heroes bro, lead to Brazil. I'm gonna hit yeah. you up, man. I'm gonna hit you up, bro. I'm gonna make a special appearance. I'm trying to recruit as many friends to come with me. Like, bro, let's go to Car- I'm like using Carnival as the hook. Um, all right, but, uh, all right. I'll teach you everything yeah. about Brazil. Teach me how to make you know twenty grand in a day, <laughs> <laughs> bro. I'm gonna I'm about to get you in shape, man. Though first, but yeah, I got you, bro. Just hit me up. Sweet. And this is totally out of order, so we'll kind of end it on this. But maybe this is a good like kind of hype up for people or call to action. So you were talking about at the beginning of the episode how Lisbon is boring, which might surprise a lot of people, and how Europe's a little bit boring especially can compare it to say like Bangkok or Southeast Asia. And you're hoping that Latin America has some of that excitement. And, and you probably know a little bit of the vibe, of course, from having spent three months in Colombia. But what do you think it is about Europe that it's missing? Like what's, what's, where, where's the energy missing? Or like, what is it about Europe that's boring that maybe South, that Southeast Asia and Latin America have that Europe doesn't? Bro, it's the vibe, bro. It's the vibe, the hospitality, like, some Europeans are like really, I hate this. I mean, I love Europeans, don't get me wrong, but it's just, I just don't like the vibe, man. Like, I just, like, I just hate it. I, like the hospitality, bro. Like I got to wait 40 minutes to get the bill or order. Like it's just simple things in my life that I, I can't stand. And then, um, yeah, it's just pretty slow. That's another thing I really don't like. It's just so slow. It's, the vibe, like it's cool to party. The party scene's great, bro. Like some of the best DJs, whatever. Like it's you can have a good time at night here, right? In Europe, right? Especially here in Lisbon. But during the day, I'm just incredibly bored. Incredibly, bro. Like I I I I'm literally thinking about flying to a random country on Sunday for a few days just to switch it up to get some excitement in my life. Right. <laughs> and work. I don't know. Go to I don't know. I don't, I haven't I'm just gonna literally probably go on Skyscanner and like pick a cunt like pick a ticket and like, you know, for a few days and switch it up. But mm-hmm. Asia, there's always something at like, the people are so warm. I can remember in Colombia, the people were like, 
really warm, like they're dancing, they're laughing and all that kind of stuff. In Europe, people just smoke cigarettes and drink coffee at you know <laughs> outside by themselves and just like reflecting on life. <laughs> you feel me? Like, yeah, I'm I know just, exactly like, what you're talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about, bro. It's just different energy. And I'm like high energy. I, like, I want to have fun. Like I want people laughing and want to help me and want to, you know what I mean? Like make my experience great because I want to make their experience great. I like tipping, you know what I mean? That's what I. That's what I like, bro. I don't like this fucking laissez-faire shit here. Excuse my language, but I'm getting too crazy here. But I don't like it, bro. It's not good energy to live, at least. All right. So if you guys uh, want to go hang out with Desmond, the play is not to hang on a European patio. Only order one drink, smoke cigarettes, and uh, watch. Uh, do some people watching. That's not the vibe. <laughs> I'll I know see you guys in Rio. About. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. You know what it is? Uh, this is totally random, but I noticed because I'm in Europe now too, um, is that the when you go to a cafe or a patio, the the chairs are pointing at the street, whereas in Latin America or North America, the chairs are pointing at the other person so that you're like engaging with the person you're with. But in in Europe, it's like you're like engaging with just like the street by yourself. It's weird. Does that make sense? Yeah, bro. It's all weird, bro. <laughs> it's all weird. Get me out of here, bro. Get me out of here. <laughs> that's mad funny. Well, hopefully that's a good uh, call to action to people that uh, Europe's not all it's cracked up to be and uh, Latin America is where it's at. Um, but with that, you know, Desmond, want to thank you again for uh, for taking the time and uh, – you know, vibing with us today. It, w- it was definitely super enjoyable. Uh, so thank you again. And would love for you to take this moment, Desmond, to just, you know, direct the audience to whatever you want to tell them about and where they can find you, where they can contact you, what they should take a look at. Uh, well, I'm all about abundance, man. I have nothing to sell you. The people who need me are going to reach out to me, right? It's how the, how the player game works. But I'm launching something called Sales Church. Right, where I'm going to be your your archbishop of getting the bags, um, some entertainment, some content, some trainings, things like that. So that will be live probably when this episode hits. So saleschurch.co, that's going to be the new the new the new content machine around all things sales, guys. So go check it out. Awesome. And the website again, saleschurch.co. Awesome. And do you want to shout out your Instagram or Twitter or anything like that? Yeah, you can find me. I am Desmond Dixon on Twitter, Instagram. I'm pretty active on Instagram. Um, <laughs> if you're if you're a bro out there that's also traveling, slide into my DMs. I love networking and supporting guys in the space. And uh, yeah, that's it. Sweet. Freddie, any goodbyes? No, it's been fun. Uh, it's been fun hanging out. Sweet. Well, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, my guest today... Desmond Dixon. You guys can uh, take a look out for Sales Church launching soon. Freddie Lansky as well. Always a pleasure. Uh, Thanks, guys, again. Thank you for the audience for listening. And ciao for now.